it occurred to me and my producer, Mike Clark, that it would be great to include a visit to the original Gemini 12 crash site in Red Rock Canyon. It's been on our bucket list forever, and now seems like the right time before we're too old to be stumbling around in the desert. Red Rock Canyon is 90 minutes north of Los Angeles in the Mojave Desert area. Many serials and feature films were shot on this same location. The Lideckers were regulars at Red Rock during their time with Republic Studios. GPS coordinates were provided by Lost in Space enthusiast David Ice, who had made his own video about Red Rock several years ago. The sandstone formations have been there for eons, but they will eventually wear away faster than other ancient outcroppings, such as the Trona Pinnacles. Almost 55 years had passed since the location was filmed for the Lost in Space pilot, and we wanted to see the crash site before any further erosion takes place. Those GPS coordinates are vital because Red Rock Canyon is a vast area, and spotting the outcrop using a pilot would be difficult. And forget about communication. No cell reception here. The hiking path is pretty benign, except for parts of the path that have been changed by weather and time. I brought along some camera equipment and extra food and water. But luck was on our side and the weather was temperate. The scenery is breathtaking, and for a while it felt like Moses lost in the desert or Lawrence of Arabia. But finally the site was reached, and we were awestruck. There it is. More than 50 years later, the legendary crash site of the Gemini 12. 50 years of rain and sun have taken a toll on the pinnacle rock, but it's basically intact. No video or picture can do the area justice. You have to see it for yourself to understand what the Fox crew pulled off in their rigging and staging of the spectacular crash, which holds up to this day. After posing for some shots, I went exploring to understand the layout. What I realized is that the Gemini 12 was rigged to glide down an almost 150 foot run at a steep angle. The Lidecker twin wires were anchored behind a large rock that resembles an eagle's beak. Using photos of the crash from the Lost in Space pilot, we lined up the camera angles for the pinnacle. We did look around for other locations at Red Rock used for the giant scenes and the cliff scaling, but we weren't as lucky at finding them. Here are the GPS coordinates for the Gemini 12 crash site. But if you intend to visit, remember that the weather conditions in the desert can be extreme. Bring appropriate clothing, hiking shoes, sunblock, and water. And don't come alone because there's no communication in this neck of the woods. It's kind of like being on an alien planet. Our trip to Red Rock was really a chance to look at the scenario of restaging the Gemini 12 crash. Mike asked if I'd be able to come up with a small, non-detailed Gemini 12, also 3D printed as used to render the 9.6 inch model, and perhaps fly it by the rock formation on a short length of wire. That gave me a bigger idea to recreate something I had daydreamed about for decades. The actual refilming of the original crash scene with a full-size replica of the Gemini 12 miniature. But would all this even be possible? Back in the day, the Fox crews simply drove their equipment trucks out to wherever they desired. For the Lost in Space pilot, studio carpenters would build platforms for the camera and the miniatures rigging and wire runs, and place numerous smoke pots employed for the atmosphere that also assisted with a wire concealment. Red Rock Canyon is now a California state park, so special effects like smoke are strictly their boatin. The Fox crew of January 1965 had a full complement of workers helping Howard Lidecker rig the ship to sail past the pinnacle. We're a small group of uh, aging fans. The filming of a full-size copy of the Gemini 12 seemed a bit improbable. But do remember, we have that digitally produced file of the original miniature to use as a pattern. It's a real challenge because of the remote location. Our goal is to shoot at the same time of year as the January 10, 1965 filming to match up not only with the crash, but the angle of the sun. I knew this setup was more than I could do alone. I needed someone with the skills who could help design, plan, and build the wire rigging. I immediately contacted my longtime friend and recently retired 
news cameraman and video editor, Glenn Loughborough. Like me, Glenn had aspirations to become a feature film television special effects man and studied the profession in his younger years. The material we're using is called speed rail. It's okay. an inch and a quarter aluminum pipe. So what's that way? Well, not much at all. You want to feel? Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> right, it's like a big tinker toy set. Uh, the base is basically two feet on a side. So these are two towers. It's the bottom one that's scary. And the problem is okay. because the ground is uneven. Right. And also we can pound it into the dirt a little bit. Glenn and I did many dimensional and stress calculations for the wires, their angles, length, diameter, and load factors. So you like this wire? Yeah, good stuff. 16th inch uh, stainless steel aircraft cable. So I figured that'd be the stuff to use and it might not show up so much. And the simple fact that all of it had to be transported on our backs and on push carts from the Red Rock parking lot to the location about a half mile into the park. Go ahead and build them and let's, let's try it. Sounds good, let's go for it. With most of those issues resolved, I went about producing a four foot diameter fiberglass exact duplicate, a perfect replica of the original film Gemini 12 miniature. One that's both fully functional with a rotating radar dome and lighted fusion core. The miniature had to be durable enough to survive this most challenging of tasks. Okay, we've got our replica. Let's head out now and journey to Red Rock. Our logistics put us past the January 10th target date to January 31st. We arrived at the parks opening at 7 a.m., hoping to be set up and shooting by 10 a.m. As we soon learned, that was science fiction. Helping us that day was my son Adam, and he turned into our MVP. Mike, who was in charge of photography, was pressed into service along with Adam, Glenn, and I as pack mules and riggers. Multiple trips would need to be made from the parking lot to the location and back. Each round trip took 60 minutes and crossed some rugged ground. After all the necessary trips to the location, we were already worn out. While Adam and I returned to the parking lot to load and transport the Gemini 12 replica, Mike and Glenn climbed the hill and hauled the upper supports. The terrain of our location was filled with loose rocks and slippery sandstone. We were very concerned about injuries and several times each one of us stumbled and fell. The perch for the upper rig barely has room for the base and getting it secure was time consuming. The lower support base is the more complicated of the two and needed careful assembly. The rig has numerous pulleys and winches to wire the Gemini for flight. For extra stability, both upper and lower supports were attached to the earth with guy wires. Crossing the numerous washes at Red Rock was physically demanding, and even more so lifting our equipment over the dry sandy riverbed. Getting everything out there and assembling and erecting the two support towers in place had taken five hours. We were nudging 3 p.m. and still had to prep the Gemini. So the way we're gonna fly it is right straight through there, just to the uh, right of that one rock there and to the left of that big one up there that looks like an eagle. Now it is time to unpack our star. Seeing the replica sitting there in the actual Red Rock location setting gave me a needed burst of adrenaline. The ship looks great and only needs a couple of add-ons to be ready for flight. But moving anything, even a few feet over the rocky and uneven ground without damaging the Gemini was risky. Okay, this is this is not what how not to do it, boys and girls, with obstacles in the way. I turned the replica upside down and installed the working fusion core. This core had the same mechanism I'd built for the original, with extra bright lights to show up in a harsh sunlight of red rock. The fusion core is secured with a total of eight tiny screws. Then it was time to install the radar dome which went faster than the fusion core. Okay, the Gemini's all there and ready for its close-up. The culmination of months of work was about to get its big test. 
Adam had gone to the top of the hill and run a pilot rope back down to the lower base. We're going to attach the Lidecker wires to the rope and pull them back up to the top. The Lidecker method calls for twin wires going through the Gemini model. The wire we chose was 16th inch thick braided stainless steel. Very strong. These are the guidelines that the ship will ride on. We had earlier tested this material and the rig and found the braiding induced a lot of friction. That would require us to actually pull the miniature forward, even though an almost 15 degree downhill slope was present. So a motorized drive was constructed by Glenn and installed on the lower rig to pull the miniature. But the mechanics of the reels kept bunching up, causing us further delays. Uh, this front one keeps wanting to do that. We're good. We were repeatedly reminded just how long the run is from the lower base to the upper rig. It was a minefield of outcrops and slippery sandstone, and one misstep from Adam could send him tumbling down a rocky slope. Luckily, Adam is part mountain goat, and the Lidecker wires reach the upper perch for attachment to the static rig. Next, we feed the braided wires through the Lidecker tubes fitted inside the ship. For durability, the end couple of inches of the Lidecker tubes were made of stainless steel. You may be wondering how we're going to accomplish multiple takes. To do that, we have to return the Gemini to the upper starting point. That's what this screw eye is for. To attach a third line to a fishing rod at the upper rig and reel in the ship. By now, we were really fighting the clock. In January, daylight in Mojave begins to fade around 5 p.m. and we were barely ready to hoist a Gemini into the air. This moment was one of the most nerve-wracking for me. As Glenn spools the Lidecker wires tighter, the ship is lifting. Will the wires do their job or have months of planning and hard work gone to waste? So far, so good. With a flip of two switches, I activated the radar dome and the fusion core. Yeah. I've got to admit, it was exciting to see the Gemini raise up against a red rock sky with radar dome and fusion core both spinning. <laughs> God, it's floating. That's amazing. That shadow. Yeah, that's yeah, really shadow shows it. Excellent. It was a moment of triumph, but only a moment. It was then we realized there was a very serious problem. All right, stop. The braided stainless steel wires were stretching, yeah. causing sagging far more than we predicted. You, you got the outcroppings rising up there. Right. And here it's, they drop down. Honestly, I think it was they, right. they put it over that way. They might have, but there's no way that it, it's stable over there. It was clear to me that the ship would strike one or more of the rock formations on the way down. You see the ropes on the upper rig are taut now. To make things worse, the pulleys on the lower tower support were becoming misaligned by the heavy load of well over 150 feet of this wire. The lower rig bolts could give way at any second, plunging the Gemini onto the rocks below. Time had run out and I was out of energy, solutions, and soon enough, daylight. We had gotten so far, but plainly, not far enough. It was time to pull the plug. Okay, I'm gonna start dropping right, it. I'm ready. And that's what I did. Our tear down and trek back to the parking lot ended well after dark. We had made a great effort against the logistics of the location's production and against nature itself. And they both kicked us hard, right in the rear. Join us for part three as we return to Red Rock for another attempt at staging the Gemini 12 crash. It's a story of twists and turns. Just putting it in here, goddamn. A story of fighting fatigue. This is getting old as I'm getting older and tired. And taking some punches to the gut. Oh, okay. With time running out, see how the crew rises to the occasion. And action! In part three of Relaunching the Gemini 12.